Welcome everyone to the ninth meeting in 2016 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Everyone is reminded please to switch off their mobile phones. No apologies have been received from any member of the committee. Today we have our second evidence session reviewing legislative priorities for crofting. As I mentioned last week, we are conscious there are some very contentious issues in the crofting world at the moment that are being discussed in the media and elsewhere at the present time. I want to stress that the committee does not want to stray into these, er these specific areas, and I would urge committee members and witnesses to focus on the legislative process, please, rather than the individuals. I'd like to welcome the, the witness panel, so Crispin Agnew, um, Eddie Ross McLennan, and Derek Flynn. Thank you for coming, and could I ask you all if you'd like to make a brief introductory statement, and, and Sir Crispin, if you'd like to lead off, please. Thank you, Sir Edward. Um, I've been uh, taking this point for an, a number of times uh, and years, and that is that the crofting legislation is not fit for purpose because it does not have an underlying policy theme which is appropriate for the present day and age. You must remember that the Act started in 1886, which was to provide subsistence farming tenants with security of tenure, a fair rent, compensation when they gave up the land, uh, and rights of succession. That security for subsistence farmers underlies the whole Act and we are trying to apply it these days in circumstances where that is rarely no longer appropriate. Onto that act have been tagged various different policies that have taken Parliament at different times. And so we have conflicts uh, throughout the act between one policy regime and another policy regime, which are very difficult to reconcile. And equally, if the land court is trying to interpret the legislation against the policy background, they have those conflicts uh, which make it very difficult. So I think if there's going to be any reform, somebody has to sit down and think what is the policy which we are trying to achieve in the crofting context. The other problem is that crofting is looked at on its own. We are sitting here talking about reform of crofting legislation. We had the Shucksmith report that looked at it and a whole host of others. But crofting sits within the policies that are required by the Highlands and Islands. Often they're in conflict. Often they don't work together. And I think that if we're going to have any legislation, it should rarely apply to the whole of the area to which it is being applied, and not have the random situation where this is a croft, an identical land holding next door is not a croft, and they're under totally different regimes. And so I think there needs to be a coordination of not only policy for the crofting acts, but also policy for how the crofting acts fits in out to the wider policy uh, of the area. And I think that really is the fundamental problem. And it's led to the crofting acts, current crofting acts, becoming extremely complicated, unwieldy, and difficult to interpret and apply. For example, the 1955 Act, uh, when crofting uh, was started again in the Highlands on a different uh, basis from the Small Landholders Act, which still applies in the rest of Scotland, had 40 sections. The 1993 Act, when it came in and consolidated the 1961 and the 76 Act with the 55, had 64 sections and it extended to 72 pages. The 1993 Act is now 125 sections, most of which are two or three times the length they were originally, and extends to 196 pages. So, you know, that's just an explosion of the complexity. Derek Flynn has worked with the crofting 
law group to produce the sump. I don't think we really want to get into the sump because that is just detailing problems with different sections, uh, statutory inconsistencies, and all that sort of thing. So, yes, that, that, you know, that is a particular problem with the current Act, but I think you need really to uh, look at the matter in greater detail. I wrote a paper uh, which was published in Northern Scotland, uh, which is a peer-reviewed journal published by the Edinburgh University Press uh, called Crofting a Clean Slate, and that was published in the 200, uh, 2015 uh, journal, and that really sets out my views on the historical problems which have led us to where we are now and my suggestion about a clean slate, and no doubt if the committee uh, wants to get a copy of that, uh, it does have certain, uh, obviously, copyright implications because it's been published in a journal and I've lost the copyright. Uh, but that sets out my, my views. Just to give a couple of sort of examples of complexity, we have a crofter, an owner-occupier crofter who is defined in a way that doesn't work, and you can end up with owners who are occupying their crofts, all of whom are under different regimes. Why not just have anybody who occupies a croft is governed by the rules and regulations? A case I've been involved in in the land court where the owner of a croft, the owner occupier of a vacant croft, got planning permission for 10 houses, which was consistent with the local development plan, uh, the Highland Council's uh, policy for that area. The crofting commission quite rightly on their interpretation of their obligations under the Crofting Act, refused to decroft it because there were four people who wanted that land for vegetable growing. Uh, now, that's where the Crofting Act was applying its policies quite properly, but was in conflict with really the wider local policy considerations. Another problem is that there's no incentive for landowners. And the whole Crofting Act is written on the basis of uh, the definition that a crofter is the tenant of a croft. Now, when you get five quid a year from the croft, it costs more than that to recover the five quid. And so landlords, in a way, have no interest uh, in being the landlord of, of a croft. Uh, and this, I think, is something that's of particular importance now that we're having community rights to buy, crofting community rights to buy, uh, and so on. What should the proper relationship be between the landowner and the crofter, particularly in that sort of community context? I was involved in a... Sorry. Can I stop you there? Because that, that, that's actually a pretty key point, and some of the points that you're bringing up are actually going to form part of the questioning that, that, that we do and, and, and actually illustrating them with uh, cases and, and examples is extremely helpful. But I think may, uh, without taking away from what you're saying, be more helpful as we raise the questions. So could, could I stop you there if I may and maybe ask Derek if, if you'd like to, to make a short statement because again, I, I really want to try and develop the questions as I'm sure the committee will with, with specific examples. Just finish up with this one last example yes. of a case I was involved in uh, relatively recently, which dealt with the breakup of a farm in 1910, where the landowner was delighted that it should be broken up into three crofts because the rent from the three crofts was more than the rent he was getting from the farm. Whereas nowadays, agricultural rents are at a totally different level from crofting rents. And it's just part of the example of why we've moved into things that are no longer right for this day and age. Thank you very much. Derek, could I ask you to... Thank you. Uh, I'm a retired lawyer. I've been retired eight years. Um, uh, I worked as a crofting lawyer, uh, and in the middle of the period that I worked, we had a consolidation of the Crofting Act. It seemed to me to be a lazy consolidation because it just caught everything that was there and the problems remained, and the problems that have remained really until relatively recently. 
The law is so complicated that the last time St. Crispin and I sat here, we were talking about an amendment, a surprise amendment that had to be made. Uh, and, and we were asked if there were any other matters that should be given attention. And from somewhere, I produced the word sump, that we needed to put all our problems in one place and somebody should look at them. Well, that somebody turned out to be myself and Keith Graham, the retired principal clerk of the land court. Uh, we were in the middle, uh, getting towards the end of writing a textbook on current crofting law. The sum took about a year to produce, and uh, we were surprised by the number of responses we got by all kinds of stakeholders. Um, and it showed uh, that there was an interest in getting things right out there, but it was beyond most people to see how it might be done. Uh, the sum took a year. The textbook that I have finished the proofs off with Keith this week took 10 years. Uh, and so there will be a, what a, a working paper to try to explain what the current law is without making many complaints about it. Um, and that will be published at the turn of the year. Uh, I believe there is, a, there is a fairly simple crofting code there. Uh, I'm not quite of the same mind as uh, Crispin. Although uh, I agree that this has been seen as part of agricultural law, in fact, it was a law that was to protect people that were immobile and really produced for their own consumption. And it is that aspect which we have been seeing the law emphasizing recently by saying that people must be living close by their crofts or on their crofts and should be looking after them, looking after the land. Uh, we've gone through a period when diversification was, was to be seen to be a good thing. Uh, agricultural production may not be the best use of the land, but the protection and the understanding of the people on the land as to how the system works has been lost because it's got very complicated. But people on the land, uh, I do hear people complaining about the amount of regulation, but uh, we really have to pin down what they're complaining about. When we talk to crofters, quite often they see no difference between the commission and the federation, which is the, the, the union, uh, and, and the department who get involved with their grants. They see no difference, it's all authority and they don't like authority. But someone has to keep a record of what we're talking about. And I think we have made great strides by getting a map-based register in place. Now that's something that we called for for 20, 30 years, and we're finally getting that into place. One of the complaints just now is that whilst crofters have to map their crofts and pay the fees and do all the work, the, the, there was a com it was a, there was a promise that the Commission would deal with the common grazings. And recently, they've been writing to say they've got no money to do it. They're not doing it then anymore. But crofters still have to map their boundaries. And without knowing what we're talking about, without knowing the land that's involved in the system, it's very difficult, I think, to, to deal with it. Um, you know, if people are arguing about boundaries, they waste a lot of time and money getting a solution because they have to go to law. But if there's a good register, then that should make life easier. Um, Is that an appropriate place to stop? I mean, because uh, yes. uh, uh, again, the, the, the registering and, and, and recording of, of, of Crofts is important. And I, I mean, I've read the SUMP report. It, it, it took me a fair while to read it and understand it, not a year, but it was extremely informative, and I know the other committee members will have done the same. So I know there'll be questions on that. So Derek, you happy? And, and no, maybe I'll bring it in there to, to have a short uh, 
uh, flavour of your views, please. Yeah, well, good morning, everybody. I'll try and keep it uh, short, uh, as you say, convener. Um, I would endorse generally what uh, Sir Crispin and, and Derek have said. Um, I think there is broad agreement within the crofting legal community, not only that something has to be done, but actually on, on what it is that has to be done. All of us have our own little hobby horses, as you might expect, but, but there does seem to be uh, general agreement, particularly uh, on the question of the, as, as Derek has described it in the sum, the impenetrability of the legislation. So, I mean, I've gone into some detail about that impenetrability. Well, Derek has, uh, and, and Keith, in the SUMP report itself, but also in my written submission to the committee. So I'm not going to sort of rehash that here. My other uh, particular concern at the moment, well, two concerns really, are, uh, first of all, the, the huge problems that are being caused, not just for solicitors, but for crofters, and specifically for owner-occupier crofters, uh, caused by the problems in the legislation around the definition of owner-occupier crofters. And I don't think that will come as a, a surprise to anybody. That's a huge problem. And because it's legally complex, it, it ends up costing crofters an awful lot more money than it should do. So the other, and the other point actually was, uh, which I've um, sort of been um, talking about for quite a while, is, is the question of funding. And that's not just sort of funding for agricultural improvements or funding for uh, new croft houses, both of which are very welcome, but actually funding to, uh, I suppose, free up the market in, in croft tenancies or to sort of make it fairer, I suppose, rather than, than free it up. Uh, because at the moment, you must be a cash purchaser to buy a croft. And that seems to me very unfair. So I'll, um, I think I'll... I mean, unless you want me to go into any more detail about the specific points, do you want me just to, to leave I, that I, there? I'm very happy for you to leave it there because you, you did actually give a very uh, fulsome uh, uh, contribution which the committee have had and for which I, I'm grateful of. Um, it, it was very detailed and, and, and thank you. It, it kept me busy for a while, so I'm sure <laughs> it did everyone else. Um, so if I, if I may, we, we have some questions and uh, the first question is going to come from... Gail Ross, the Deputy Convener. Thank you, Convener, and welcome. Thanks for coming along. And thank you for three excellent introductory speeches. I feel that we learned quite a lot about that before we even go into the question and session. Um, I'm going to start with um, a couple of questions on the Crofting Commission, bearing in mind um, what the Convener mentioned at the outset about not going into the specifics of what's happening at the moment. But to touch on the, the changes in the 2010 Act from the Crofters Commission to the Crofting Commission, I think, was obviously quite a, a significant change. And you'll be aware that we took some evidence to the committee last week. Um, and three main points, I think, uh, to bring up at the moment. Patrick Krauss from SCF uh, argued that there needs to be a review of the functions of the Crofting Commission and there should be a more devolved system for regulating crofting. Um, Peter Peacock of Community Land Scotland stated there's a clear gap on crofting development, which actually now rests with HIE. And others agreed that more needs to be done in terms of development. And indeed, Elian, in her written evidence today, um, urges us to consider whether the Commission once again should be appointed rather than elected, um, which is uh, also a, an interesting point indeed. So I think I'd just like to ask what your views are about the changes to the role of the Crofting Commission and the name in the 2010 Act, um, especially in, in respect of whether there should be a review of the Crofting Commission um, with a view to creating a more devolved system for regulation, uh, the function to develop crofting and what your view is on elected commissioners. Um, and also as a follow-up, is the current structure of the Crofting Commission right as it is now? So that's a huge question, <laughs> which you'll need a moment just to gather your brains on. What I'd like to do is, if, if, if you would like to lead off rather than me trying to uh, point at somebody and say, right, you, you're up first. If you, if you feel you've got a point to start off with, very happy to take you in whichever order to start. So, Derek, you, your hand came up first. Thank you. Uh, the, the arrival of elected commissioners came at a time when the function of the commission was to regulate, and I think few of the elected 
commissioners could have expected what they were to do was simply to read the act and try and find out what it said and then do it. There was very little handover in my, ex <coughs> my experience because I was involved in helping the new commission read the act to see what they were supposed to be doing. Things had changed in the law and we had to look very closely at the wording of the act to understand what the commission's powers were or what they, their duties were and the number of different words that were given to the Commission's functions was astounding when we went through the Act. Uh, so the Commission had, this new Commission of <clears throat> elected strangers had to sit down and figure out what they were to do. And, uh, and it's meant that they, they got off to a, a slow start. Um, the, sorry, I'm trying to catch what, the, the, the development function, uh, at a time when uh, crofting was allowed to expand by new areas being taken in to crofting, or the potential of crofts being in new areas, uh, there was nobody looking at the possibility of new crofts in these areas. Nobody at all, because the development function, such as it was, was moved to HIE, who were only looking at existing crofting communities and only a small proportion of them. So developing crofting as something new and attractive uh, fell on stony ground, and those outside who were wanting in have found nobody to help them. Sir Crispin. Um, I was very concerned uh, constitutionally when commissioners were first uh, elected because uh, under the current acts, uh, the commission is a tribunal. Therefore, it's part of the court system. And as far as I was aware, this was the first court with elected judges in Scotland. And I thought there were profound constitutional issues arising from that. We were going down the American route of electing judges. Now, there's currently a consultation to stop the commission being a tribunal. And if that goes through, uh, that will take away that particular concern. Uh, all the local authorities are elected and they make policies, uh, they regulate, uh, particularly in planning. Uh, they have all sorts of enforcement powers and so on, which are taken by elected officials. So uh, if one takes away the fact that it's a tribunal, then we have democratically elected institutions to regulate uh, functions uh, and so on. Uh, so that's uh, perhaps acceptable. Uh, what does cause me concern is the separation of regulation and development, because in a way this goes back to what's the overarching policy, because if the policy is to achieve development, then the way you develop is linked to the way you regulate, and I think it's very difficult to separate, separate the two. So that's my sort of general view uh, on, uh, on that. Uh, there were various other parts of the question which I've in a way forgotten, but I think that's what I particularly wanted to say. And Gail will come back if she hasn't got all the answers she needs, but, but maybe we could bring Ellie in at this stage. Okay, uh, well, I, I think uh, the first part of the question, I, I think I understood to be, should there be a review of the current Croft and Commission uh, arrangements? And I, I think that yes, there should be. Um, and in fact, I... My own view is that that's the one part of, of any reform of crofting legislation that should be prioritised. I think part of the problem with the last reforms, uh, and particularly the one in 2013, seemed to be that there was such a huge rush to get it done. And I'm, I'm not sure that that always results in the best bit of legislation at the end of it. Um, so I think probably the, the idea of, of taking our time to reform the main body of crofting law 
is a is a good idea and to sort of work out exactly what we want to do and take the time to to, to do it carefully. But actually, in terms of the crossing commission, the trouble is that you know I think regulations have already been put before Parliament actually for the the, ne the next elections, which are to happen in the springtime. So you know that's all cracking on, and you know that any new elected commission are then going to be in place for another five years. So you know changing that I think is going to be tricky once you have elected people for for five years. So that sort of then kicks that into the long grass once the once the new commissioners have been elected. Um, so, so generally, yes, I think there should be a review. Um, the second part of the question was, I think, about the, the devolved decision-making of the Commission. And, and I think what was discussed at last week's um, evidence session was that there would be, and I think something that the SCF are very much in favour of, is sort of local bodies taking decisions locally. And this was something that the Shucksmith report looked at, um, you know, back in 2008 from memory. And at that time, I was of the view that probably more devolution of these decisions was, was not favourable, and I still am of that opinion now. The, the Crofton Commission is sort of all things to, to all crofters, if you like, and it's a whole lot easier to direct any um, uh, sort of, uh, uh, I suppose, discomfort that you might have with any decision, regulatory decision that's being made. That's much, much easier if they are government officials based in Inverness that you never have to see when you drop your kids off at school, for example. But if the people that you're seeing in your daily life in small Crofton communities, um, you know, where things can actually become quite politicised quite, quite quickly, um, I think that would cause... I, I, I personally wouldn't like to see that. But actually what, what might be worth thinking about is the, the system of... Um, area assessors, which, I mean, the Commission have long had area assessors, and they have always been the sort of Commission's eyes and ears on the ground. And it strikes me that there might be a sort of, uh, some kind of compromise to be uh, struck there, where you have an enhanced role of those area assessors with enhanced accountability that way, but actually the, the decisions are still being taken by the Commission officials in Inverness. And the, the third part of the question was about the elected commission. And I mean, obviously, I've made my, my position on that very clear in my written submission. I, it's very difficult for me to give any sort of more specific information about that because I did act for the commission previously. And in fact, I acted for the Crofters Commission before them as well. So I'm, I'm sort of um, understandably limited in, in what more I can say. But it does seem to me that, that generally speaking, when the law was reformed in 2010, there was dissatisfaction that the Commission wasn't doing enough to, for example, regulate absentee crofters. It was, it was thought generally that the Commission uh, should be doing more to regulate crofting. There should be tighter regulation. But instead of, you know, so in, what, what could have happened is that the law was changed to say, instead of the Commission having a, a choice to regulate, which was the position before 2010, the law could have simply been changed to say the Commission must regulate. But actually what's happened is the law has changed to say the Commission must regulate, but also, by the way, you know, we think that they should also be elected. So in a sense, the baby was thrown out with the bathwater at that point, because actually if you'd kept the old structure of Commission, but given them an enhanced push to regulate, that might have had the effect of, of meeting that desire that people were expressing for tighter regulation. Uh, but without the huge upheaval, and it has been a huge upheaval, that the, the new structure of the Commission has, has caused. That one of the points you, you, you brought up there about the election of the new Commissioners, will be, the Committee will definitely bear that in mind when the Cabinet Secretary comes in with the uh, statutory instrument to ask him about that. Now, Sir Crispin, I know you want to come back in, but, but Stuart and Rhoda and, and, and John are, are queuing up. Could I, could I just see if I could get... Stuart, in and maybe give you the first chance to answer, which may weave in your point as well. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. I, I just wanted to pick up on particularly what both uh, Derek Flynn and Sir Crispin said in relation to the understanding the elected members uh, of the Commission have of what their role is. Um, and Sir Crispin referred to quasi-judicial role, and I'm not going to address that. I just wanted to be clear whether it there was a clear distinction in the witness's mind over the need 
to, for members to understand whether they are executives of the Commission, in other words, managing the day-to-day -day activities and taking responsibility in a line <coughs> management sense, or non-executives whose role I would characterise as um, a, appointing and removing senior members, uh, uh, managers in the organisation, uh, approving the policies of the managers of the organisation and bringing forward policy proposals to be developed and implemented by the managers. Is there that opportunity for there being a clear distinction for those who are elected who are not required to have any particular experience to bring other than experience of being crofters? Is, is, is that part of what underlies what I think I will stretch the boundaries by cause, describing as a rather dysfunctional board? That's almost stretching the boundaries, so Chris will, will, will lead off. Um, the Crafting Commission now regulates, so the decisions have to be made by the commissioners. And they are acting, at the moment, they act as a tribunal, uh, i.e. in the nature of a court. If that's taken away, they have to act quasi-judicially, rather like a, an elected local authority making decisions uh, about various aspects. So uh, the, they're not there in a sort of non-executive role. Uh, they are there, they have to make the decisions. At some levels, it's a decision whether A can take over a croft. Uh, other decisions are at the policy levels, but the policies have to relate to their regulatory function. So they might have a broad policy as to the sort of person they would accept uh, as a new tenant of a, of a croft. Uh, I think the chief executive is probably there to manage the staff, but the staff are there to serve uh, the commissioners uh, and to provide them with the necessary information and so on. But they're not there in a non-executive role. Every decision, or perhaps I should say every important decision has to be made by the commissioners. They might delegate a certain, uh, some of the more minor ones uh, to the officials, uh, but you know, it, it's their decisions. Sometimes they delegate it to one commissioner, yeah. sometimes they take the matter to the whole board. But I, I think you've got to be very careful. But can, can I just really just come back on that, having, having spent 30 years working for the Bank of Scotland, not on the board, but often present. The board, wholly non-executive, nonetheless had the final approval of the major lending decisions but they had no role in developing them, writing them, or the material. The decision was theirs, they were non-executives. Is that not the parallel that we should see in the way uh, the, the, the Commission works? The responsibility for the proposals, the detail, ensuring it's legally compliant that's put before the decision makers is, is a management role, but the decision itself is one that can properly be made by people who have no management function they're non-executives, they carry responsibility for the decisions, but they are not executives. Am I, am I missing the point in the way that this does or should, and I make that distinction, work? My understanding is, let's say, somebody decides to assign his croft to somebody else, not to get the consent of the commission. If it's got to be advertised, if there are objections, there's a hearing at which is conducted by one commissioner with staff. The commissioner then reports back to the board. So it's the one commissioner, in a way, is reporting back and taking the function. It, it's not a member of staff is sent out to hear the evidence and then he makes a recommendation to the board, uh, which is rubber stamped. Uh, and I think if it's going to be a regulatory function, then it must be taken by those who are the regulators whether they delegate to one person, to three persons, or the whole board. Uh, if, if you're into development and that sort of thing and running it more as a local authority, uh, if you like doing development policy and all the rest, then perhaps you'll have more what you're describing as the non-executive 
uh, rubber stamping the policy which is really being implemented uh, at the local level uh, and so on. But it's part of the clash of policies, which is the point I wanted to pick up, this drive for local ownership and then you have centralized regulation. Uh, take South Eurist, which is now a community company with, I forget how many crofting townships in it, there are probably about five or six. They might have an overall policy that they would like to apply within their area, but it's all been dealt with in Inverness. And I think one, this is why I said one needs to, again, to think what the relationship is to be with the landowner and the commission. I want to add something briefly to that. I'm, I'm, I'm only always conscious of the time, and, and we're on question one, and we're, we're, we're a quarter of the way through the timing session, so I, I, I would make, uh, hopefully briefly, okay. is that the staff almost look to the commissioners. They are making the decision. But with this commission, it was the same personnel as the previous commission, which Shucksmith... Uh, the Shucksmith report had sought to disband. Um, I think that there was. Uh, yeah? I'm just You're being careful that we are not going to drift into personalities. And we're, and we're I beg your pardon. The no, no. The, 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 on the Committee of Inquiry on Crofting recommended the disbanding of the Crofters Commission. Now, what that does to the staff of the Crofters Commission, one can only imagine. But after a long period, they are given uh, completely new personnel as a commission, and they are in control. And as I said before, they had to sit down and look at the acts to find out what they had to do. Now, there was very little handover, probably because, partly because uh, the previous commission expected it to be defunct. Pick up on a point on that. Just, just a, a small point about, I suppose, the conflict between the, the tribunal function and the elected function. And um, Sir Crispin Agnew said that the tribunal function could be removed from the Commission and that would make it um, more compliant with certainly our understanding of how those things do. But where would that function then lie? Would we end up with a Commission on the Commission? Would it be the Land Court? Where would that? I'm going to come back because I thought I'd picked up that he said that he didn't think it would be appropriate to separate the development function from the regulatory function. But, Sir Crispin, do you... The point that I want, was saying that, it, if you like, it's a technical constitutional point that under the present law, the Commission is defined as a tribunal under the Tribunal and Inquiries Act. And we are going into electing tribunal judges <laughs> and I thought that was a constitutional problem. We were going down the American route of electing judges. There is currently a consultation to take the commission out of the Tribunal and Inquiries Act so it will merely be an elected body uh, which will be carrying out regulatory functions subject to appeal on most points to the land court or judicial review by the court of session. That, I think, is constitutionally acceptable. It's like a local authority uh, licensing committee uh, which uh, has regulatory functions, either granting licenses, taking away licenses, and so on. I, I just, if you like, was taking a technical, a technical point. I'm not saying that the, tri the regulatory function should be taken away. I'm quite happy that the Commission should carry that out. Uh, whether it should be devolved, uh, to meet sort of local local needs is a different matter, uh, whether uh, and how it should operate. But uh, my view is that you want to be more like a local authority, where you have the development function, the local policy functions on housing, uh, population retention, what planning development should take place, and you have a regulatory function if somebody puts a building up in breach of the planning regulations, then the local authority regulates it and enforces it. But the two are very difficult to separate. More things are going to end up in court, rather, if you do separate it, will more things end up in court than do currently? Yes. Um, can I, can, 
just mindful of the time, Derek, and I noticed you raised your finger. John wants to ask a question which you, you may be able to add uh, specifically the point you want to raise. And Elliot, if I've missed you, you can, I'm sure you'll do the same. Sure. I mean, this is a more general point. I, I'm a city person. I'm fairly new to this whole area of crofting. I realise some of my colleagues uh, have a lot more experience of it. But, I mean, I mean, the word that has come up a number of times this week and last week is shucksmith. And, I mean, as, as somebody new to all of this, obviously I've got the legislation, so we can look at that, where we are at the moment. But is the shucksmith report a good, also a good place to be starting at and looking at what they said? Is it still relevant today? Is there stuff in there that is useful to take us forward? Very, very short answers, if I Yes, I, I, I think we must Hello. use it. it. It was the biggest investigation of what crofters wanted um, since the Napier Commission in 1886, so I, it's very valuable, and I can't imagine that we want to go off and do all that again. And respect and buy-in for it? A lot of... Well, respect, or it was, there was a kind of a general acceptance eh, of Shucksmith? The, the one, <laughs> we're talking about a, a, a small world here <laughs> where there are opposing voices uh, uh, and not everything pleased everybody. No, 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 exactly. uh, and even the government's response to Shucksmith about the formation of the, the commission, it, it agreed that there was going to be area bodies and we didn't get near that. We just moved uh, the Crofters Commission into the Crofting Commission with all these different things to do, the, the annual return, uh, the introduction of a map-based register, which is colossal on the Commission side as well as at Registers of Scotland. And I'll come to you, Sir Crispin, at the end, if I may. Um, extremely briefly, the, I suppose it might be worth distinguishing within the, Sh the Shucksmith report between the research that he and his team carried out and the recommendations and the implementation that followed it. Because it might well be, I think, it, I didn't agree with everything that the, the Shucksmith uh, report recommended, but I, you know, I do support the research that they carried out. And certainly I don't think there's much of an appetite uh, in, you know, for repeating that exercise having you know, uh, evidence sessions in, in the Crofton counties and so on. So it might be that we can still make use of the investment that was made by Shucksmith and his team, even if that means changing some of the recommendations that were made. We can sort of maybe you know, pick and choose. I was just going to say, if you don't know much about crofting, read the Shucksmith report. It's very good, useful background material. My complaint about the Shucksmith report that uh, was, as I said right at the outset, is it was looked at crofting in a bubble. What did crofters want out of it? And it didn't, it wasn't an investigation as to what is needed in the wider Highland area uh, for, and how crofting fitted into it. It looked at crofting narrowly, and I think that, that my view is that was its failure. But qua investigation, it's well worth reading, because you can see all the different views which I think are probably just as relevant today as they were then. Um, I'm delighted we've now got off question one. Um, <laughs> and uh, we're going to move over to Peter, who's got some questions on the next thing. And if I could ask you, I, I think Peter's question is going to be t quite targeted. So uh, a quick answers, or uh, not politicians' answers, would be much appreciated. Peter. Yes, my, my, my question is quite targeted. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's about the, the 2010 Act and the introduce, introduction of a register of crofts. Now, that register is moving on, as we know, as crofts are assigned and decrofted. It, it, they appear on the register. Um, there's three specific things I want to ask about that process. Um, the, we heard last week that the cost to crofters of, of, of uh, no, public notification was quite quite high, and, and could we do something about that? We also heard that the, the mapping of grazings was seen to be a very important part of that exercise, but we, we heard that that had almost ground to a halt. Uh, we'd like your, your thoughts on that. And, and the third thing I would ask is, what do you feel about the, the option to appeal to the land court as being the only way to, uh, uh, to re resolve a dispute in, in this region? Sir so Crispin wants to go first. I've got 
one general point about the, the, the registration. I think it's a very good thing. There's no end date. Uh, at, at the moment, uh, up till 20, uh, 2007 Act, uh, you could prove that a croft on the register was no longer a croft uh, if you proved that it was there in error. They put that right in 2010 uh, by saying that if it had been on the register for 20 years, it was unchallengeable. But everybody had asked that the converse should apply, that if it hadn't been on the register for 20 years, equally you couldn't apply to get it put on. Uh, you probably heard of the Dornoch uh, Golf Club case, which is going in the land court, where a crofter has come along and said the uh, Royal Dornoch uh, Golf Club is in fact on a common grazing, even though the evidence is it hasn't been used for grazing since the 1930s. I've been involved in a lot of cases where people have come out of the woodwork and said this is a croft. And I think we need an end point that once the register is apparently full, there should perhaps be, you've got five years, anybody who claims that land should be on it to get it on. If it isn't on, the, if you like, the register should be closed so that you can't have anything coming out of the woodwork. And I think that's quite important. Otherwise, it's not a definitive register. <laughs> And solicitors will always have to say, because this land is next door to the common grazings, next door to a township, uh, we'll have to uh, go on for that. To answer your last point about appeal to the land court, uh, I'm a qualified mediator. I'm a great fan of mediation. Uh, the Scottish Government puts into various legislation these days options to mediate. And I would have thought that uh, if you could perhaps have a mediation service, perhaps funded by the Scottish Government or uh, funded by the Commission or supported by the Commission, uh, a mediator might well be able to resolve sort of boundary disputes and things like that in a cheaper way, perhaps, than going to the Land Court. But the other things, the, the other two are better to com comment. Ellie, if I could come to you. Um, do you agree with the end point? Yes, I do. I do. And I, I think, actually, it's a, it, that's a role that the Crofting Commission, when it was the Crofters Commission, and when it still had a development role. Uh, I mean, I remember I worked as a student actually in the Commission uh, before the development function uh, was given to Highlands and Islands Enterprise, and it was really a, a very common occurrence for senior Commission officials, not just commissioners, but senior officials, to go out to sort of um, hot spots in the Crofting counties where people were unable to make any progress with various disputes that they were having. And so often they were able to make progress with that. And it was a real shame, really, that um, that, that seems to have, that seems no longer to be as common as it once was. The hearing system is, a, I suppose that goes some way to, to doing that. But the, the problem with a hearing is that it's a, it's an extremely, well, it feels like a very formal environment to people. Um, and uh, because it is a tribunal. And actually what, what I think worked better was sort of, um, you know, more informal meetings, everybody sitting around a table trying to work out essentially mediation by, by another name. So yes, I think I would agree with that. <clears throat> uh, the first point of the question on the, the cost of public notification, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it is good for local newspapers, there's no question about that, but, but that's really the only, um, you know, uh, uh, benefit that, that there is to it. And it strikes me that nowadays uh, there's no reason actually why you couldn't have some kind of uh, web-based notification system which would cost, you know, be cost neutral, I would think, once it was established. But, um, <clears throat> excuse me, so, so there's that mapping of the common grazings. Yeah, I mean, the crossing register in general has been, uh, you know, it's hard work to get there sometimes, uh, you know, because it, there are boundary disputes. Not in as many cases as I feared, actually. Uh, you know, it does happen, but by and large, people do manage to sort things out between themselves before it gets to that point. And, uh, and if it does get to the land court, even then, it's still possible for, you know, once people then take legal advice and, and they're able to sort of work out, actually, you know, do I have a case here? Is there, you know, am I just misunderstood or whatever? And then, you know, people are able to, it doesn't necessarily, just because you apply to the land court, it doesn't necessarily mean that you end up, you know, in a, a village hall in Durness having a, you know, a, a land court hearing. Uh, although, of course, that does happen sometimes. So, yeah, by and large, that the crossing register has, has, has been a great thing. It's a shame that the mapping of the common grazings has, has ended. But, 
you know, I think that was the, the withdrawal of funding. But the Commission are really, really well placed to carry out the, the registration of common grazings, I would say. The, 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 the mapping of the, the common grazing has ground to a halt, but do you think that that, that, that is something that should change and that, that process should continue? In an ideal world, yes, I, I would like to see it continue, but right. uh, I'm, I'm aware that that depends largely on funding being made available to the Commission for that to happen. Yeah, okay. Derek, do you want to add, hopefully, your agreement or a short... <laughs> um, I I see the common grazings as being a, a land asset at a time when we're talking about land reform. Here is land that's already in the hands of other people, of uh, local people, uh, and the mapping of the grazings is one way you can focus on this asset. It is unfortunate, I think, that uh, it's called common grazings because uh, even within the Commission, I found recently uh, an understanding that it could only be used for grazing. Well, no. Um, this is one of the difficulties of crofting that we uh, started off with common grazings. Even the land register, uh, the register of Scotland wanted to call it uh, initially uh, a, a register of common land, but that means nothing, that's bringing another term. So we now have a, a, a register of common grazings and land held run rig. Now, I've been involved in crofting for a long time, I've only once ever had a client who claimed to be involved in the Runrig system. And we've got things like that in the Act. Runrig, cotters, uh, without anybody looking to see if we've really got them. In, in the department regulations, there's a mention of Kyle's crofters. I don't know what they are, and I keep asking people. And the answer, the best answer I've got, if you were a Kyle's crofter, you, knew, you would know you were. Well... <laughs> I'm writing a textbook and I can't find the answers. Uh, uh, hopefully this textbook will still be relevant after this inquiry, but uh, thank you for that. And, and unless there's anything particular that the committee would like to ask, I'd like to move on um, to Stuart, who's, who's got a question on uh, regulation, I think. Uh, well, in particular, the 2010 Act made provisions in relation to absentee crofters and neglect of crofts, and I really just uh, hopefully can get a fairly brief answer as to whether that's had any beneficial or deleterious effect. I express a personal view um, that what we're talking about is a law that protects the people who are on the land, and I believe the law should do that. I think it should be for the people who are living on the land and looking after it. Um, in principle, I agree with Derek, but where there aren't the jobs uh, or enough people to be able to work in the area, should people be able to go away? work and then come back because there's a very strong emotional connection with the land and I think absenteeism has to be linked to whether in fact you have the job opportunities uh, in the area otherwise you are forcing people to come back when there isn't the wherewithal for them to live there if, if it's available and there are jobs and all the rest in the area, then yes, force them to live there. But I think there's got to be a certain amount of sensitivity that if somebody's gone to Glasgow to work because there isn't work locally and perhaps comes back to help with all the uh, gathering and uh, comes back at weekends to work and so on, uh, maybe I think there needs to be flexibility, that's all. Just from that, it is of course possible for people to be legally resident in two places at once. I got a nod, so I'm correct in that. Yes, thank you. Yes, providing they, they don't uh, stray too far away from the croft according to the registration. Only it is uh, so. You... Yeah, so I'm, I'm sort of um, I'm somewhere in between Derek and, and uh, Sir Crispin's uh, views on this actually. Um, I'm, I'm well aware of uh, how painful it can be for people who are uh, forced, really, to give up their crofts because they are unable, for various reasons, to, to return there. 
Um, and that's, that's something that sort of haunts people for, for decades. This threat of the Commission might regulate, the Commission might terminate their tenancy. Um, I suppose that the issue of, of the tightness of regulation, particularly on absenteeism, um, goes to the root, really, of what you want crofting uh, to achieve. Is it, is it about population retention? Is it about agricultural activity? Is it about protecting people's rights to their family um, uh, heritage? And I suppose if, you, if you're clear about that, and my, my recollection of, of the Shucksmith report was that it was a lot to do with population retention, which was why the priority was at that time to regulate um, people who were not ordinarily resident on or near the Croft. But of course, you know, no sooner does the... Com and, and there's no question, by the way, that the tightening of the regulation on that point freed up Crofts. Absolutely no question in, in my mind that that was the case. Um, I, I've acted for a huge amount of people, uh, you know, both who were sort of being um, pursued by the Commission uh, and who were then receiving Crofts uh, from people who were being pursued by the Commission. So that did happen. Um, and I dare say that was, the, that was what it was intended to, to achieve. But of course, no sooner had the Commission started to regulate on the basis of, of residency, um, but people started to say, well, actually, it's not really about residency, it's actually about what you're doing with the Croft. So it's more important uh, you know, to, to, to be working your Croft than it is to be resident there. Um, and I suppose that, that, comes up, uh, that comes down to policy priorities and, and what the Commission uh, want to do and what guidance the Commission are, are given by, by government and, and Parliament. But um, I think whilst it's difficult for people who are the ones being regulated, that's always going to be the case. That's, the, that's sort of just the nature of it, I think. Uh, but I, if, if, the, if, if the desired effect was to free up the number of crofts to enable new people to move there, that objective was, was met in my experience. So, I as well. Okay, perfect. Uh, then there's uh, Richard's got a question about uh, ownership, I think. Uh, good morning, uh, gentlemen and lady. I think Sir Crispin and Derek Flynn, I met you when I was last on the Rural Affairs Committee, which was discussing crofting, so nice to be back. Um, <laughs> deja vu, yeah. From my mind, I'm a lowlander. Um, crofting effectively has been a tradition in Scotland for hundreds of years. Landowners gave their local population land to work on, land to live on, give them a living which they paid rent. I don't think I'm wrong in, in, in that uh, situation. Crofters worked the land, the land uh, was still theirs and, and we've now got a situation where some crofters now own their land. And, I'm going to quote back, Ellie, I'm going to quote back a, a, a point you've put down. Crofters were given the right to acquire the crofts in 1976. Crofters buying the crofts were called owner-occupiers, for want of a better label. However, the term is never defined, defined in law, and the legal reality for those crofters who have purchased their crofts was what they considered to be landlords of a vacant croft. So these people who were working the land now are landlords. And basically, as a landlord could then turn around and give their croft to someone else to work. So would the panel agree with Murray McShane, who last week said there was no good reason why owner-occupier crofters should be subject to the same rights, same obligations as crofters who have remained tenants? Is this one way that crofting law should effectively be simplified? You can go first on that, and then Sir Crisford. <laughs> I agree. I think uh, crofters should be the name given to those people who properly occupy the land. Even the terms are, are, are unhappy, but if you have a croft that is mapped and registered, you should be able to record the person who should be occupying that land who has the right to occupy that land. We can't control ownership of land. Anybody can buy bits and pieces, and that's one of the difficulties of crofting. If, if it is not understood, if there's not a transparent system, nowhere to go to look at the maps to see if this land is croft or not, then people buy pieces of land 
uh, and, and some people have built houses on land which is actually in crofting tenure. And trying to unravel that is virtually impossible in some situations. Uh, there is an, a suggestion somewhere that they, in the sum that the commission should have a right to go and look at the reality of a situation and find a solution. But some people have no way out of the, the difficulty that's been created by the confusion of the law before. And so now we have the possibility of registering pieces of land which are identified as crofts and a place we can put the name of the occupier who's been approved either by succession or whatever by the commission's uh, uh, approval. Um, so th that would bring some simplification to a system which has got terribly complicated since 1976, since title deeds started uh, being made available to tenant crofters. And with the rules that people should be residing on or near the croft, then it becomes more important that we identify who that person is. But the law has changed to allow this annual notice to be sent out to the occupier to find out if the occupier on the register is in fact living there and looking after the croft. These are changes which have come in recently and which, have, which, have, uh, which I applaud. And that, just, yeah. Can I just clarify? I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if everyone else on the committee has understood that. I think that, well, I certainly haven't. But Murray McShane basically said that if you are an owner-occupier, you should no longer be regarded as a crofter. That's what he said to us last week. Are, are you agreeing with him or disagreeing with him? Sorry, who said that? Murray McShane, when he was here last week. Well... Uh, I, I mean, you, there's nothing wrong with no, no. disagreeing with him. <laughs> we had an act which introduced owner-occupier crofters. But he was suggesting a way forward in the future, I think, which was the point Richard was making. Uh, respect you could get, he was suggesting that someone who bought, was a crofter, worked on the land or whatever, and then bought the croft, that they should then no longer be considered a crofter. Do you, do you agree with that or disagree? No, I do not agree with that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I, was waiting. I, I didn't want to interrupt you. I beg your pardon. Sorry, so, so Crispin, do you want to follow on with there that? Is, a crofter is defined as the tenant of a croft. Section 19, capital B, defines owner-occupier crofter, and it's a very highly technical definition. If you own your croft, but you don't come within the technical definition in 19b, you are an owner-occupier or a landlord of a vacant croft. And even though you might be exactly the same as a 19b person, you are subject to the crofting commission coming along and ordering you to relet your croft. So you've got three different types of occupiers, different regimes, highly technical. I think that you should define what is a croft, which it'll be ultimately be in the register. Whoever is the occupier of that croft should be subject to the rules and regulations that apply to crofts. And it shouldn't matter whether you're the owner, a crofter, or whatever. If you are occupying it, under a sublet as the owner or as the full tenant, the rules that govern the use of that land should apply equally to anybody and you should do away with all the different definitions. Yeah, I, sorry, I, sorry, I, 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 don't, I don't want to interfere with a 200 year or more tradition or, or something which is inherent in Scotland and I'm, I'm proud of what I'm proud of being Scottish and proud of uh, you know, what we're doing, but what you've just told me is basically bordering on a situation where it's so farcical. If I'm a council tenant, I was a council tenant, I bought my council house, I now own that house. If I want to go away and work in Australia for six months, I still own that house. What you've just laid out to us is all in the last hour is a situation that if people buy their croft, if they don't work it, 
Somebody can go and snitch on them, report them, and basically, with the greatest respect, I, I do apologise for the word, all hell breaks loose. Is that where we are? Sir Crispin, can I let you come back, Sir Crispin? I know Aileen's itching because I've, I've read, as we all have, her submission, so she'll have strong views on it. So if I could let Sir Crispin come in briefly and then Aileen come back, that would be very grateful. Very briefly, this is a matter of policy. At the moment, a croft is regulated. But we've got the odd situation that different people are regulated in different ways. Now, if you want to get rid of the regulation and stop crofting and have free use of your property, I'm not against that. But if you've made a policy decision that this area of land should be, re the use of this area of land should be regulated in a particular way, then my view is on whatever basis you occupy it, you should be subject to the same regulation. I hope that answers your question. And you must remember there are quite a number of small land holdings under the 1911 Act in the Lowlands. And indeed, I was looking at one at Dam Head uh, only yesterday. I think it's, a, it's a fair point. Why, why do these crofters, uh, you know, why, why should they be answerable to, to the Commission? And I suppose in general terms, I see the crofting system as a, like with most things, you've got rights and you've got responsibilities. So as a crofter, you have, you have very strong rights, actually, of security of tenure, of succession, of compensation for permanent improvements. You get extra public money over and above the agricultural support that other farmers get. So some people would say you get a pretty good deal. But the flip side of that is that because you get a good deal, you've got to comply with certain regulations. You've got to be there you've, to, to help population retention. You've got to do something with your croft to facilitate landscape management and you know, facilitate the agricultural production in whatever small way it happens in these um, outlying areas. So I think, in my mind, that's sort of the justification for it. But there's no doubt about it that it is a farcical situation uh, that exists currently where you have these three groups of people. The whole point of the definition of owner-occupier crofter was to sweep up the landlord's vacant croft so that they could be regulated in the same way as tenant crofters. But the problem was that the, 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 the definition wasn't drafted in a way that did that, so it was unsuccessful. And so that's why you've got this group of people. And to my mind, the, the greatest danger to that group of people, actually, is not really the commission forcing a tenancy light on them, because the Commission have had a policy since 1976 not to do that, as long as you were compliant with crofting legislation. But you are actually at the mercy of the Commission on that point. If somebody wanted to make something of it, I'm sure they could. From the Commission's point of view, it's also difficult to regulate. It's been well known over the last sort of 20, 30 years that if you wanted to sort of escape Commission regulation, buy your croft, become a, an owner-occupier, become the landlord of a vacant croft. Because then, although the Commission can regulate you, it's so much more difficult than it is for them to regulate tenant crofters because the procedure was there, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Act, and everybody knew what they were doing with that. So, uh, you know, it, I think at the, at the time, that was what was trying to be achieved, but it, but it wasn't. And the various problems, which I'm, I'm not going to sort of go into just now, they're, they're in my written submission, but the various problems which befall that group of people are really quite serious. It, it, you know, it can cost them a fair bit to go through all of the legal processes to get themselves, and it's not always possible, but sometimes you can get yourself from that sort of neither fish nor fowl category back into being an owner-occupier crofter, or you can enter back into a, a tenancy arrangement, but it's not always possible to, to rectify that, so it is a huge problem. And I mean, Derek's been recommending the, the concept of a proper occupier, I think, as long as I've known him, a long time, um, and, and to Crispin too. And, and it, there's no question it would make it would make life an awful lot easier. And you know, perhaps if if we are beginning with a clean slate, rather than try and cater for these two different groups of people, because ultimately, you know, over the fullness of time, over several generations more all crofts will be purchased, actually. You know, everybody will eventually get to that point. For various reasons, that's the direction that we're going in. Um, I mean, I forget that the current, uh, I think it's about 5,000 crofts that are 
have been purchased. But I mean, it could be far more than that because lots of people don't tell the Commission when they buy their crofts, even although they should do. So um, I, I think that would, uh, yeah, I mean, you're, yeah, but there's no, um, there's no, there's no penalty for that. So, Rich, Rich, briefly, yes, briefly, Terry, yeah. uh, because I do like your illustration of the council house. Uh, uh, maybe I, I should say that where public monies and support have created the situation, it doesn't seem to me to be unreasonable to say, and I suppose if I'm allow me to follow this on, the formal council houses should be occupied and kept in good order. Now, I think that's uh, it's not an illustration I've used before, but if I said that to, if there's a council house stock that is moving into private ownership, but there still should be a, a rule that they are occupied and kept in good order, and that would parallel what I'm saying about crofting, have the, the, uh, I don't have that you have, I don't have the crofting commission coming after me. I so, I, 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 think, um, <laughs> I think we may see a split in the committee if it comes down to discussing ha council house purchasing. I, I like the analogy there. And, <laughs> and, 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 I, and I take the point out, and I think, Richard, your point's... For I, 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 I know other people have got questions. Could be that I, I may want to come back in if there's time. Thank you. Can, can I move from what I thought was not going to be a contentious issue to one that perhaps is, and, and, and just advise you again, if I may, please, to concentrate on the issues rather than the personalities, and, and John's going to lead this question. Okay, well, I don't, I don't even know some of the stories that are going on, but um, we, we mentioned grazing, uh, common grazing before, um, and I'm specifically interested in the uh, grazing committees. So, I mean, on the whole, are grazing committees working? Is the legislation a fit for purpose, or do they need to be looked at again? I think broadly, no. And that's to deal... Uh, I'm, I'm not dealing with personalities or some of the current issues, but it's the very narrow role uh, of the grazing committee uh, under the Act. Uh, which is basically uh, that the grazings committee are there to manage the common grazings and to uh, maintain or replace the fixed equipment. So they have a very narrow role uh, under the Act. Now, with the subsidy regime, with all the uh, environmental obligations, uh, and all the other agricultural obligations uh, which are floating around under totally different legislation, the Crofting Act isn't appropriate mechanism for trying to manage all those other functions because the Act doesn't, in fact, allow it to be done. And uh, where grazing's committees have tried to, if you like, expand their function to deal with uh, other legislative requirements. If somebody doesn't want them to do so, they can frustrate them from doing so because uh, the legislation doesn't give them those powers. So I think really it goes back to my what's the policy, what's the uh, aims behind the whole thing. Uh, you need to look at what the proper role of the grazings committee is or is not going to going to be. Uh, they tend also. Well, specific things that were raised with us included that uh, nowadays it's a lot more than just grazing. There could be a lot of other uses, and uh, yes. income coming in. There's a bit of a question over how that's handled. Well, we yes, uh, and that's because they don't uh, under the Act. Uh, they don't have those functions. Uh, they were given a function under the 207 Act in which they could borrow money and things like that. That was taken away in the 2010 Act. Uh, so th th that's why I think the whole of that needs to be looked at. Because, yes, the money that comes in for the uh, subsidy uh, is money that's technically due to each of the graziers uh, out of their own rights, but shouldn't come centrally. If you're running a sheep stock club, which is often done on the common grazings, 
That's not a raisings committee function. It should be a function uh, under your lease, uh, which sets out how the uh, sheep stock should be graded. I, I can go into it in, in great detail, but you don't want me to do that now. But it's, That's but, you know, clarified. The, it's just that their powers are very narrow under the Act, and they don't, they're not fit for purpose in the modern day and age where there are all sorts of other regulate other legislative and European factors. Hold on, sorry, uh, John. Uh, I, I was going to bring Andy in there <laughs> first, if I may, and, and, and then Derek in afterwards, please. So the, the question being, are grazing committees working? I suppose in the, in the majority of cases, they, they probably are just about. But it, I suppose I, my experience of, of being a solicitor has sort of led me to believe that there is quite a widespread concern, not just amongst uh, shareholders about grazing committees, but also uh, inside grazing committees about are they doing what they're supposed to be doing. A lot of people running grazing committees are doing it on their own time. They're putting in a, a lot of effort uh, into what they're doing. They're doing it entirely in good faith, but entirely without training and support. And that's a lot to expect of, of people, actually. And I think that as a first step, you know, that's one thing that, that is required because you know, it, grazing, it's a different world now. And, and actually, the, the law relating to common grazings, um, I mean, it has changed quite a bit, actually, over the last 20-odd years. Um, you know, you can have croft or forestry now, you can have other developments on croft land, you can have new common grazings, you can do other things with common grazings apart from, from just graze. So it's a, sort, it's a different environment, but I, mean, I don't think the grazing regulations produced by the Crofters Commission in sort of standardised format, I don't think they've changed in a generation. They've sort of added bits onto them for crofter forestry or, or other things, but basically it's the same set of regulations. And frequently, I mean, I take Crispin... That's because of the Act, they can't... That's right. Um, and, and Crispin's point there, you know, about, um, uh, you know, about grazing committees, I, I, you know, I, I, think that's, I think that's true. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, think, um, I think increased training, increased support, um, if not wholesale, sort of um, uh, look at actually what are grazing committees there to do. But at the moment, you've got a, a sort of unfortunate situation generally, and this is not specific at all, but in lots of cases, uh, you've got clerks and common grazing committees who feel exposed because of increased duties on them, you know, to prepare reports on all the crofts in the township. That's a big ask to, to ask somebody to, to do that. Um, and you've also got lots of shareholders in, in common grazings who are wondering what exactly is going on and, and you know, are, what's happening to the money and, you know, resumption money and this money and that money. And there's, there's, there's not enough clarity. And, you know, I, I think all of that is, is sort of ripe for improvement. Today we're not highlighting the problem, so that's helpful to get that. Derek, uh, you were wanting to come in. I think in, in, in short terms, uh, the... The way I describe it is in common grazings, uh, management is in need of a new business model. Uh, there are too many functions now available. Uh, but I think retreating from that, uh, I would say that in any walk of life, it seems to be more and more difficult to form committees uh, because the responsibility is there. The, the Common Grazings Committee in, in, in the last round of reforms was given the, the function of reporting on all its tenants uh, as to what they were doing with their crofts. Um, and although the Commission itself has sought to water that down, that's not what it says in the Act. Um, it, it is what it says in the Act, they should be reporting on all the crofts. Um, but the Commission have uh, backtracked them because they know that's that made a lot of committees unhappy that they would be policing their neighbours in some way. Um, but uh, the new business model to cope with modern times uh, is a must, and it's, it's not even somewhere that the sump went. It got far too complicated. 
I, I've got a couple of questions, if I may. Sorry, I've been waiting patiently on, on grazings. And uh, there's, there's two particular things that I'd like to ask you. And one, I, 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 Derek, I note your point that the Commission has turned a blind eye on the reports. And when I asked the Commission how many reports they'd received, they wouldn't tell me, but, but it was no more than a couple of hands worth, they said. But I think that there's two questions I would like to ask you. Is, 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 is one is... Do you think, I mean, some grazing committees are in receipt of a huge amount of funds, um, and do you think that they should be treated differently to those people, the grazing committees, that have less funds? And the second question, which is almost unrelated, is do you think it's appropriate for grazing shares in the common grazings to be separated from the croft? Because we certainly heard last week that that was a, an obstacle um, to new crofters coming in and uh, young crofters coming in. So I don't know who'd like to tackle those two questions. There are two big different questions. Uh, could you give me the first one again? <laughs> That's what well, I've lost. <clears throat> the, the first one is, 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 do you think that it, there should be a different business models depending on the, the, the size of turnover of the common grazings, cash-wise? And the second one, is, is whether it's appropriate to separate shares and common grazing from the craft. Right. The different business models, I think there should be a range of business models made available by the Commission. And, and separating shares, common grazing shares from the craft. This was, this was a problem foreseen in 1976 when crofters were given the right to buy their croft land, but not the share in their tenancy. Um, it was only really recognised when the Commission had to catch these shares, which hadn't um, pursued the ownership of crofts and got separated from them. Uh, and the Act said in 1976 that they would be deemed to be held in tenancy and they would be deemed to be crofts. And there was a great, almost an outcry that this should happen. But the law had been in place like that and had been well, subject to criticism, but no activity since 1976. Should, um, well, I think there is a trend that they get separated because not everybody wants to work the share in the grazing. Um, uh, um, one of the difficulties had been that people hold chairs in the grazing that they never ever use. This is the, really the difficulty of common grazings, that some people want to use 100% and should be entitled to 100% of the value of what they do, but they only get their own little share of the value of what they do, and so less people get involved. So, uh, if you separate the share from the croft, uh, you are sep you're making the croft unviable agriculturally, basically. People are very keen to separate the share uh, if there's a wind farm in the prospect because you then get uh, the money for your share from, uh, from exploiting the common grazings for whether the landlord's doing it or anybody else. Uh, you then sort of end up with a whole group of people who have a share in the common grazings but no land nearby. So uh, do they have to live within, uh, what's it now? 32 kilometres. 32 kilometres. It was, was 16 miles. 32 kilometres uh, of your share. Now, if you have a common grazing that's 10 miles wide, do you have to live... Where, where, is the, where is the 20 miles from this end or that end? Uh, I personally think they shouldn't have been separated. They are currently separated. We recently had a land court case which said you can assign it separately so you can separate it off. When you buy your croft, you're not entitled to buy your, common, your share in it. It makes it a separate croft. Uh, we've, pass, you know, we've sold that pass. Uh, I would like to see them all reattached. Uh, if you're going to keep an agricultural content uh, to it. Uh, so that's really the separation of the shares. Holding money, under the 
under the Act as it is at the moment, the Common Grazing Committee should not be holding any money, excepting money they've recovered from the shareholders for works that they have done on the common grazing to maintain it or put in fixed equipment or improve the fixed equipment. They can also be given uh, the money from a resumption uh, which is given to them to distribute to the shareholders who are entitled to it. But I believe sometimes it's kept by the grazing committee for then for use in the future uh, on maintenance and so on. Maybe everybody's agreed to that, but it's not something they're entitled to do under the Act. And so uh, that's why one needs to look at what powers do they have. Yes, they can get, they get sort of environmental money, because in a way they're the only people managing that area, but they don't have any right to manage it for environmental reasons. They only have a right to manage the common grazings for grazings. So that, that's why uh, the whole thing needs to be looked at in detail, again in the context uh, of, you see, their, their, obligate, their duty is to maintain the common grazings and to provide, maintain, and if necessary, replace the fixed equipment required in connection therewith. So it's to maintain the common grazing. Uh, so, you know, th that's part of the problem, that it's not fit for purpose. Ailey, do you want to mm, add you. something to that? Um, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, so the first part of the question was, should shares be, uh, should there be different business models for different types of common grazing operations? That's not something I've ever thought of before, but it strikes me as a really good idea because there, there is such a breadth of, of grazing committees. You get some that are not even regulated, and so really there's no way of establishing who holds a share in that. Or you, you can, obviously, but it can, it can get difficult. Um, you have some common grazings who have maybe two or three active shareholders who are, maybe they have a sheep stock club, maybe they don't. Um, you get some who have really quite substantial sheep stock clubs with quite large amounts of, uh, of funds uh, coming in and, and going out from that. You've, you've got uh, others uh, where there are large uh, renewables developments and obviously that's a, a sort of different uh, different uh, class entirely of, um, of, of, uh, of funding that, that's coming in from that. So good idea. The second question, should shares be separated from, from Croft? Um, I think we're, we're all sort of um, uh, harking back to thinking back probably here to the, the reference that the Crofting Commission made to the Land Court a few years ago. And Crispin mentioned that in, in, in what he's just said, and that, the land court in that case said that, yes, when you buy your croft, it is separated, and you're left with this grazing share. What can happen, actually, uh, is that regardless of whether the grazing share has become detached from the croft, and that can be an issue not just in sort of everyday life, but also particularly at succession, where a crofter dies and it's an owner-occupied croft, uh, quite often you will find there's no mention made of the grazing share because the crofter never used it and you know the executor who may or may not have knowledge of, of the crofter's working it's never mentioned as far as the executor is concerned so it's not mentioned on the confirmation so the succession to the grazing share is never attended to and then when somebody decides in 20 years time to ask the commission who shares in that common grazing that's somebody that died 20 years ago and there are remedies to that you the commission can terminate the tenancy the landlord of the grazings can can terminate the tenancy but also what can happen is that if if somebody in the township wants to be an active crofter but needs more of a, a share in common grazing than they have so say they're assuming is for four cows and they've got their four cows, they could really do with another four cows to, for whatever reason. They can, they can actually go to the grazing's committee and say, look, can I use so-and-so's share? And that happens quite frequently, I think. So that's a sort of cobbled together uh, solution that, that might work in the short term. But, uh, but it, it does get messy when the crofts are separated that way. Do you want, Mike, do you want? Well, yeah. Technical question really for my own information. Obviously, all the grazing, all the grazing committees will be of a different size. But I was just trying to get a grip of, a, is there a sort of common size to a grazing committee? In other words, how, what are we talking about? How many, how many crofts would be involved normally in, a, in an average grazing committee? I mean, just to give us an idea of scale. I don't think there is an average, to be honest. I mean, you get some They're common grazing. Yeah. They are, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, you get, you get some uh, townships in Lewis, for example, where... 
I mean, obviously, the, you know, there's thousands and thousands of crofts in Lewis, but you've, you've got um, some of the crofts there will actually have common grazing shares locally, and they will also have a share in, for example, the Stornoway General Common Grazing. So they'll have two grazing shares. Um, you know, our own township in, in Skye has got 12 or 13 crofts, 12 or 13 shares in the common grazing. That's fine. You get other crofts, uh, crofting timeships where there's two crofts and two shares in common grazing. Some of them are hundreds. So I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to dodge that and say I, I can't give you an average. I'm sorry. The Act says uh, appoint a grazing committee of such number as the meeting shall decide. So it can be whatever they like. I'd like to go back to the chic stock clubs. It's not the function under the Act of the Grazings Committee to manage a sheep stock club. All sheep stock clubs used to be, pre-Second World War, operated under the Provident and Industrial Societies Acts, and there were obligations under those acts for financial regulation. My view is that there's an argument that any sheep stock club ought to to be regulated, still regulated under those acts, although I know most of them no longer do so, but I think they, in a way, come under those acts and they ought to be registered and, and regulated. But uh, that's terribly complicated and it would be sensible that they are regulated by the Grazings Committee, but they can't be under the act. That's, for the future, this is why it all needs to be thought about. Sorry, could I just come back in there. So I misunderstood your question, Mr Rumbles. I thought you were asking about the average size of a, a township, not the committee. Well, no, that was really. Okay. I was trying to find out. That's also yep. interesting. But, uh, okay. but I was just trying to find out. And I, I understand, obviously, they're all different. But it goes to about the previous questions about what types should be, how we should handle the different types of grazing committees. It's always the biggest committees who've got the most activity. Sometimes you will have much smaller townships with a lot more going on. Um, so there's, there's no... Richard wants to come in very briefly, do you want on uh, this, or at the end? Uh, at the end. Okay, fine. Thank, thank you. Uh, I think that we, we, we've navigated those uh, rough waters quite, quite well, so I'd like to go to Mari and ask her, she's got a question to ask. Yeah, it was just, you had mentioned in your evidence, Ailey, about the, the funding. I mean, quite a, a lot of detail there. And you mentioned el earlier as well about having to have the cash to be able to, to buy a croft. So it was really just a, a question about that. Uh, because are there other ways in which young people and those that live locally uh, would be able to purchase a croft? Uh, and what suggestions would you have? Or how do you think that, uh, yeah, we could potentially move forward and make some changes there to, to enable that to happen? Well, th thanks for that question. The, the, um, it's a huge problem for people because, you know, unless, you, unless you're able to borrow from family, friends, unless you have a, a home that you've got equity in that you can remortgage and use that to... Uh, but, you know, for the vast majority of young people, you know, they've only just got a mortgage and, you know, it's going to be 10 years or so before they've got sufficient equity to think about doing that. <clears throat> Excuse me, so it is a problem. Um, and, and by and large, there, you know, there aren't any ways around that. Um, you know, I mean, even even sort of personal loans from from banks um, will will usually come with the caveat that you're, you know, they've got to be used for a certain purpose. And if you're truthful with the bank and you tell them that what you're going to do is is buy land with it, they they won't lend. So, and they certainly won't lend uh, sort of, you know, on a mortgage. So it's a huge problem. I mean, I. I, I certainly, what I don't think is, is an option moving forward is for commercial mortgages as they are currently to be used to buy crofts. I, I think there's, there's such a huge gap between where we are at the moment and what would need to happen. Nothing's impossible, obviously, um, but there's such a huge gap. And there's, there'd be an awful lot of persuading of, of lenders um, to do, and they would need to know that their rights were going to be secure. And that, I mean, that was actually part of the crofting register was, was the theory of it was to, to give everybody certainty over their rights, but particularly with a longer term view uh, so that lenders would know exactly uh, what they were having a security over. So I, I, I don't think there's a, a ready-made answer. I certainly don't have, unfortunately, a ready-made answer um, for the committee or for anybody else. But um, it strikes me that, you know, it's, it's a it's a problem, um, and it's it's something that I hear 
Um, I do some, some um, teaching for the Scottish Crofting Federation for incoming crofters and new crofters. Um, and it's a cause of huge frustration for people because they, they wonder really how are they ever going to do it if they don't have a family croft um, or they don't inherit a croft or they don't have a, a sum of money. And of course, all the while, the value of crofts is going up. So on the west side of Lewis, you may well be able to get a croft for £15,000. You know, on the Black Isle, um, you know, it's going to be tens of thousands of pounds uh, at least. So, and that's, you know, there aren't many people who could buy a house for that amount of money without a mortgage um, at a young age. So, um, so it's, it's a huge problem. I think this goes back to <coughs> the problem of putting a value on a croft and the problem of there being or not being a marketplace for crofts. In my memory, you don't have to go very far back to when the Commission refused to accept that a croft had a value of more than the permanent improvements on the croft, that there was no additional value because people wanted that specific location. Or, uh, and we had to confront that. We held a, a seminar on the value of crofts at Plockton when we invited speakers to talk about the value of crofts. And we got the value of crofting as a, a social value, but you can't put a pound sign on to that. But we did get the district valuer coming along and said the government will look at the value of the crofts as open market value. Uh, and I think there is still out there a resistance to accepting that a croft has an open market value. Now that will pose difficulties going forward if, for instance, uh, the children of a deceased crofter are all entitled to a share of the value of the croft, it will mean that these crofts will be marketed to get the highest value. Now that has already in the past produced problems, but it's, in reality we have a system which has resisted being in the marketplace. And the future holds that it will be dragged into the marketplace if it's not already there. Now, the, the, the other people in the marketplace, the lenders, don't like it. They will only really lend on decrofted houses, which are easily marketable. Uh, and until a marketplace is set up for crofts in tenancy, for instance, nobody's going to lend on these things because they're so very difficult if things go belly up they're so difficult to get the funding back again. The, the proposal that tenancies should be registered, which should make them uh, available for lending on, which came out of the Committee of Inquiry on Crofting, uh, seemed to me to fail to catch that the present law requires that if a lending goes belly up and the crofter goes bankrupt, the money comes from the landlord. And I know that uh, the landlord uh, representation uh, did not quite understand that the easiest way to get the money out of a croft is to, uh, that's been vacated by someone going bankrupt is to get the land court to fix a valuation. And the payment is made from the landlord's resources. If that landlord is a company that's limited in Andorra or Liechtenstein, as some of them are, you will not get that money. So, uh, you know, anybody lending and burning their fingers on that is just going to pull out of the lending place. And you want to add? Uh, just briefly, as a matter, uh, a, a commercial lease of 20 years or more can be recorded in the land register. Once it's recorded in the land register, you can record a standard security against that lease. And then the standard security holder can take possession of the lease and market it and so on. Because a crofting lease is a lease from year to year, it can't be registered in the land register. Therefore, you cannot have a standard security over the lease. And one of the Shucksmith's recommendations was that the law should be changed so that lenders could take uh, could take a standard security and register it in the land register over a crofting lease. And part of the crofting register was to facilitate, uh, facilitate that. There was a lot of resistance to it from the crofting community because they saw uh, 
lenders coming in, foreclosing on the crofting lease, then selling it on the open market, and so on. And there was resistance to that. But you know, if if you go, you need to set up the legal system whereby that can be done. If you're going to if you're going to provide for it uh, through the commercial sector, I was in the agricultural holdings uh, legislation review group, uh, and uh, we had various meetings with bankers uh, about lending to agricultural tenants and uh, security issues there. And uh, it might be worth looking at that report because there was discussion from the lenders or the circumstances when they would lend to agricultural tenants and so on. But uh, it wasn't a very sort of positive or strong one in the, in the way of crofting. And therefore, as uh, Ailey said, the only way to get a mortgage is to buy your croft house, decroft it, take it out of crofting, divide the croft, make the croft smaller, less economic, and so on. And you then end up with a house that's sold separately. You have a bare land under the Act. On my interpretation, you can't then apply to put another house on it unless the landlord agrees. Uh, some people disagree with me. Uh, you then put a house on it. You then buy that, decroft that house, and you buy it. And part of the sort of conflict is there's a sort of theme to encourage crofts to be divided and made smaller and smaller until all you end up with is a whole bundle of house sites. Stuart's got a quick question, and then I want to, to, to look more generically. I think the committee does at the future. So, sorry, Stuart. Can I preface it by saying, if it can't be answered in two sentences, please don't answer it. Um, while there can't be standard securities unless the lease is 20 years, is it possible to get the same certainty for the lender through adopting a process of real burdens instead? And I ask this as a non-lawyer. The is no. I think you That's need, to have, need to have a standard security and to have that, you need the legislation change. Perhaps that you can have a standard security registered in the land register. Disagreement. So I'm going to move on, if I may, and ask John to, to, to Finney to take us on with, with, with the next one. Thank you, Kavina. Uh, good morning, panel. I would like to talk about the, the, the future. Um, you may or may not be aware the programme for government for 2016 commits to begin work on a, quote, a, a national development plan for crofting and to do so this year. Uh, now, if I noted you correctly, Sir Crispin, you talked about and questioned whether there was an underlying policy theme connected with crofting and you, you said it couldn't be viewed in a bubble. Ailey, you mentioned about pop population retention in agriculture, loose and derrick, land use featured. Um, the development function did move to high. I just wonder if you would like to express a view on what you think this national development plan for crofting is likely to result in, um, in, chain in terms of any policy changes. Now, nothing to do with the, the technical legal issues that we've identified, but on policy changes. And would you like to speculate um, what should be part of that, please. That's a difficult one. Derek's avoiding it. Uh, so uh, I, have, <laughs> I must confess, I haven't, haven't thought about it at all. Uh, I think there will be a problem, just from a legal point of view, in sort of trying to have a policy on development when you've got the current act with its limitations. Uh, I think it will be a good thing to have it, uh, a discussion about it. That might then lead to a discussion about what's in fact the underlying policy for crofting and therefore what do you want to end up with with the new and simplified, simplified act. Uh, but yes, uh, again, it's development of crofting, but it's development of crofting in the context of the development of the highlands and islands. And I don't think you can separate the two as we have done. And I would like to see it really as a policy for the development of crofting in the wider context of the requirements of the crofting areas. And I suppose it illustrates to me how odd it is to have that function 
uh, with Highlands and Islands Enterprise rather than with the Crofters Commission, where, it, in my view, it should be. Um, <clears throat> to have that, to have policy consultation going on at the same time as possible uh, legislative changes, and I mean, surely the surely the two uh, have to be done in, in tandem with each other. But um, yeah, I, I, I think I suppose my, my my view really is that the development function should be with the commission. Um, that that for, for my. Uh, for my money would be the starting point is that it should be with the Commission and then you know uh, as part of the same exercises what do we want crofting legislation to do well what do we want croft what do we want the crofting system to do because if if we don't if we want the crofting system to do something entirely different I mean surely the crofting legislative system should simply be providing the, the legal framework for implementing what we want the crofting system to, to do with respect, do you have a view on what that should be? There's been issues raised about housing, frequently the technical issues around that, but population retention in many remote and rural areas is absolutely dependent on housing and a dearth of housing in the association of land. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, having having lived on Sky for the last three years, um, it is there, there simply is no uh, private market, uh, rental market, from March until October. There, there is just nothing. And the amount of people who are obliged, really, to move out of uh, their accommodation in March, uh, whether they want to or not, um, you know, to make way for, for tourist accommodation, it's, it's you, you know, you would just assume that everybody was doing that unless it was their own property. So it's a huge problem there. I know it's a huge problem in, in other parts of, <clears throat> of the Crofton counties too. Excuse me, too. So, yeah, I think population retention um, is, is a thing. I also think the, the agricultural element of crofting is still important. Um, I think that, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm no agriculturalist, but um, I, you know, have sort of day-to-day -day, uh, dealings with agriculture, and it, it seems to me that it is an important part of the culture of these places. If not, I mean, it's, you know, it, it, the amount of money probably generated by the agricultural economy in, in the crofting counties is probably not going to change anybody's life, but, but it is, a, you know, going to the market and, you know, that whole cultural aspect um, is, is quite important as well, I think. Ken, if he wants to come in, he's been deliberately trying to avoid, avoid my gaze, but just in fairness to give you a chance to answer that before I bring back Sir Crispin, because we've got a few more questions and time is not waiting for us. So Derek, if you'd like to add something briefly. Briefly, um, I'm, I'm of a mind that crofting is not an industry. And I think that's something that uh, most of the people out there are not participating in the cropping industry. Um, and the system itself, um, we've moved towards a protection of the system and a sustainability of population. And, uh, and I see that as be it's for the people on the land to do with what they will with that land that's in their control. And the annual returns, checking that, the map-based register, and the clear statutory duties to live on or beside or can look after it, it's, has been a big movement towards that. Um, uh, there has been, a, in the past, uh, a tendency to see crofting as part of the agricultural law of the land. And we have separated it. Now, whether it's a good thing or not uh, is perhaps an argument, but we now have different titles. Uh, the Steer Encyclopedia of, of Scots Law, we persuaded them to move that out of agricultural law and give us our separate title, crofting law, because it is different. We're talking about a different history, a different feel to it all. Um, at a time of land reform, it seems to me that a system that allows individuals to hold small areas of land under a settled system is extremely valuable. Sir Crispin, do you want to add something yeah. briefly to that? Very briefly. I would agree population retention, housing sites and so on. Ask yourself, why should the croft land be providing the house sites? because it's quite a convenient way to regulate it and you can buy, decroft, blah, blah, blah. If you want housing, you need a wider policy. Well, why shouldn't there be compulsory purchase powers for acquiring land elsewhere? Land Reform Act is giving communities greater rights to acquire land. 
That's why I say we don't want to look at it in a bubble. And in a way, why should croft land be providing house sites, which are then decrofted, which are reducing the amount of croft land, if having croft land and crofting is an important contribution to the overall development? It's a decreasing asset. And that goes back to my bubble point. Are you happy with that, or are you happy with that? Okay, thank you. Um, Jamie, I think you've got a question uh, relating to uh, land holding. Thank you, convener. Um, my initial question was going to be a very specific one, so I'll ask it very quickly, and maybe you, you might have a short view on it. And that's simply about the uh, simplification of crofting law and bringing together the current legislation on small landholders with crofting law, if there's any merit in any consolidation. That's a very brief question, but I think overarching there is a wider theme here in how we as a committee look at the future of crofting law. And just quoting from a piece from uh, some written submission from me, I'm sorry it's not dated, but it just says, whether you believe the solution lies in fresh legislation, redrafting, consolidation or restating, the one point which we all agree on is that crofting law needs to be improved. Therefore, my question is if you could each give me one piece of advice to this committee as we think about the structure of any future legislation, what that piece of advice would be. So it's two questions. It is two questions, if you'll <laughs> indulge me. I've been Sorry. quiet all day. So. You've been very, very good. And, and so the, the question is whether stake, uh, smallholders should come in and the advice. Who wants to start? Oh, it's Chris. If you ask any of the small landholders, they don't want to come under the crofting regulation. Uh, it was offered to Aaron, who had been made one of these areas. As far as I'm aware, nobody's applied to become a crofter uh, from Aaron because of all the uh, regulatory difficulties there. Um, unless you're going to apply crofting to the whole of Scotland, again, as happened in 1911, I think the answer is no. I think they need to do something different with the small land, land holdings. Uh, one bit of advice I'd go back to think of what your underlying policy objectives are before you start doing anything with the Act. That's very succinct, Derek. You, uh... I'm for it. I think small landholders should be dealt with under the same or similar legislation um, because new crofts don't have to bring with them the right to buy, uh, which was an important part of you know, what, traditional, what happened to traditional crofting. So if you're creating new crofts now, you don't have to give people the right to buy. You can re resist the right of assignation. That's who, who the next croft is going to be. So the new crofts are a different breed to old crofts. If you were creating new crofts, now, I feel that there's a suspicion that some people think new crops will never be created, and I find that the community-owned lands are wanting to create more crops. They see it as a way of holding population. Um, so I see nothing wrong with small holdings elsewhere having very clear, a very clear code uh, and having their land registered. After all, the, the, the new crofting register is a map of the whole of Scotland with crofts placed on it. There's no reason why uh, small holdings shouldn't also be recorded in the same register. Eddie, have you, have you got something you'd like to add to that? Yes, just very briefly. Just to, to clarify, um, Mr Green, that the, those comments were made um, in a paper that I made to the Crofting Law Group conference, and that was in 2013. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't have a view on landholders, so I'm not going to make one up here. Um, I suppose one piece of advice, I would echo what, what Sir Crispin has said in that, you know, make sure that it does what you want it to do. Um, and also, I suppose, just I made the point earlier, but, but you know, not, not to rush it or not to rush the, the, the bulk of it, certainly. Um, it, would be, it would be lovely to think that within the next few years, we had a, 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 you know, a crofting act that did what the consensus seems to be we want it to do and to be able to get used to that and work with that 
and it, it's hugely labour intensive actually coming to terms with with new legislation because you you know you're not familiar with it so it would be lovely to get to to grips with something properly and to, to get used to working with it and to have that for uh you know the foreseeable future anyway um jimmy you happy with that there's, there's penultimate question is from Reda and I'm looking at the clock, and, and I'm going to be very tight on, um, on uh, how long I give you in the sense that you've got, I'm afraid, a, a short time. But, Rhoda, please. And it follows on, I think, from Ailey's last comment. You know that we're looking towards new crofting legislation. The government have said at the end of the parliament they'll bring forward new crofting legislation, and that's why we're really having this inquiry, because there seems to be pressure on to deal with the issues in the sump, maybe other issues along with that, given events recently, or maybe not the whole sump. Should we be dealing with that as a matter of urgency, or should we be consolidating? Should we be doing them both in different orders? Should we consolidate first, then look at the sump, or should we be starting um, with a clean slate? What's people's thoughts? So, a very short question, which is very easily answered, <laughs> and uh, Sir Crispin was wanting to go first. <laughs> uh, uh, I, there is a section, I think, in the 2010 Act, which says if, if the government brings forward a bill to consolidate the uh, crofting legislation, then prior to the bill being passed, they may bring in statutory, a statutory instrument uh, amending the legislation, amending the legislation so that they, in fact, are amending the consolidated bill. It struck me as uh, very convoluted uh, and difficult. Uh, um, I can't pick it up, up immediately, but I think it's uh, somewhere in the 2010 Act, or perhaps it was introduced into the 1993 Act by it. But uh, it does say, if the government brings forward a consolidation bill before the bill is passed, they can amend everything uh, that they want to to do so. So, as I say, it seems rather convoluted. Uh, yes, if you want to do a sort of corrective, a consolidation and a corrective to try and put right the things that are in the sump, yes, that would be one, <laughs> one way to approach it. But I think it needs a much more radical look at, why don't you apply it to every land holding in the Highlands? Um, Derek? I've been at many uh, stakeholder groups and I'm not hearing an awful lot coming through as to changes in what I would call the code, the, what, what, what we're about. There's a lot of unhappiness out there, but I'm, I don't hear anything new as yet to change things in the way, for instance, as Crispin's suggested. Um, and there is a lot of um, discussion. There are, I've, I've been to 10 stakeholder meetings. Uh, there's a crofting uh, stakeholders group, but we've had less meetings because we're waiting for something to happen. I don't see a lot of changes coming forward. Ailey. It's section 52 of the 2010 Act. Thank you. <laughs> So um, my, my view on that is actually um, on the final page of my uh, submissions before, before all of those annexes. But I mean, essentially, I think that the, the, the Shucksmith report, I don't think that needs to be revisited. I've said that already. I think that the, the, the entire act needs to be rewritten. I think we need to start with a, a blank sheet of paper um, and with a, without going back to work out exactly what the priorities are, but you know, use the Shucksmith report as is, and use the evidence that the committee gathers, and you know, take a decision on what you want it to achieve, and then sit down with a fresh bit of paper and try and avoid these the sort of layering and, and the impenetrability that, that Derek's talked about in the sump, and that we all sort of um, are all too familiar with. Roger, is there anything else you'd? Roger, is there... um, I, I hear what Ailey's thoughts are. The others give give ideas that are out there, but not their own thoughts as to how we should proceed, and I would be, I would welcome those. Well, so, so, so it should be new what, legislation, yeah. or consolidation, or a new act? Or the sum. Derek. Well, you have to take what we've got 
and do something with it. So blank sheet seems to me to say, well, you've, what have we got? We've got security of tenure, we've got compensation for improvements, we've got fair rent. Are we going to change that? Because unless you have the basis changing, the crofting code remains the same. The general policy as to whether we're sustaining a population or whether we're creating a, an industry that's uh, producing agricultural goods is, is, is a different debate. But the actual working of it, the, the people's control over land and their rights in that land, are we attacking that? Are we expecting anyone to attack it? Are we expecting it to change? Uh, and to me, it is it's not a consolidation, but it's certainly a, a simplifying of what we've got there. Simplification. You simplification and Sir, Sir Crispin. Um, I think that a matter of urgency, the act needs to be consolidated and during that process simplified uh, in some of the ways uh, which we've suggested, uh, which could be done under section 52. I think that's a matter of urgency and to put right the various somethings. Uh, I think in the longer term, somebody needs to look at, if you like, the policy for the crofting counties and in the wider sense. Um, I have not chaired this very well because I had a question to ask at the end, but I seem to have eliminated myself on a timescale thing. And I know Richard's got a question. And do you know, if, Richard, if I've eliminated myself, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to hold on to yours. And we could submit it as a written question. Um, if, you, if you want. Okay, if it's a very simple one. Well, with all you've said, I will go over it. Do we honestly need the Crofting Commission? Yes or no? We're going to have crofting, uh, which is subject to rules and regulations, then you need a regulator. Yes. Really? Really? You need a regulator to implement the, the, the system of regulation. Yeah. I, I would thank you for your offer to stay on. Thank you. And, and, and thank you for letting Richard to ask his question. I'm glad you answered it so succinctly. I could give you each a minute if there's something that you would like to leave us with before you go. Your evidence has been extremely good and extremely helpful. So, but if, I'm happy to give you a quick chance to say something else if you feel you've missed anything. I'm not sure if I... I think the role of the landlord, particularly where you have community ownership, uh, is something that needs important consideration and how their role links in uh, with the, role, the regulatory role of, of the Commission. Whether one wants to apply that also to private landlords is perhaps a matter of policy, but I think, it's, I think there are conflicts between community ownership and community objectives and aims when it's being regulated separately by the Commission. Eddie, do you want to say anything? No, I've got nothing further, thank you. Terry. No, I would echo what Crispin has given. Um, but no, I, I have nothing else. Okay, well, that concludes our formal business. And uh, I'd like to thank the uh, witnesses for coming. Sir Crispin, Derek, Ellie, thank you very much. It's been extremely informative, I think, to all of us. And thank you very much for sticking to, to very clear and concise answers on, on the issues. And, and I'm sure if there's any matters that we discuss later that uh, you won't mind if we come back to you uh, with, a, with a written question if we think there's things that we need clarity on. But thank you very much for coming today. Thank you. I'd now like to close the meeting.